This is the video for the second part of the second section of Kant's groundwork. So just three topics this time. Uh, we're going to cover how the will works again, because this comes up again in this reading section. And again, it's a little complicated, but this will mostly be review in a way. Second, we're going to cover the example that Kant gives of uh, the lying promise and what it means to use somebody as a mere means in that example. And then third, we're going to go over his distinction between autonomy and heteronomy and what does he mean by these two. So first, topic number one, how the will works. So if you recall from the previous reading and the previous lecture, we had a sort of extensive discussion of how the will works and imperatives and maxims and all this stuff. We get a sort of quick run through of this again sort of described a different way on page 45 in the reading so he says the will is thought as a faculty of determining itself to action in accord with the representation of certain laws so hopefully that sounds kind of familiar so the will is the sort of power that we have to control ourselves and to decide to act in certain ways and to move our body around and stuff like that and so the way the will works is that we have these sort of laws out there and the will represents the laws to us and so we act on the basis of the representation of those laws and Kant calls the representations uh, imperatives. So the law is something like uh, eat a sandwich if you're hungry and the imperative is something like you ought to eat a sandwich if you're hungry. So that's how our will functions. It's a faculty of determining itself to action, so of sort of moving ourselves, of making ourselves act. And such a faculty can be there to be encountered only in rational beings. So this is something special about us and any other creatures who have rationality, if they exist. We have wills. Other animals do not have wills. Uh, other animals have uh, instinct and stuff, and so they act on instinct we act on will. So other animals don't act in accordance with representations of laws. So other animals don't have sort of uh, imperatives in their head that they're acting on. Other animals are just sort of acting automatically based on their desires or as Kant calls them inclinations. So we're special because we have a will and any other rational creature is special because it has a will. So rationality is what makes it possible to have a will. Rationality kind of puts you in charge of yourself. Now that which serves the will as the objective ground of its self-determination is the end. So this is new, kind of. This didn't, I think, show up in the last lecture. But this is not new in Kant. We saw this in uh, section one, I think, the first section of the groundwork, where we talked about means and ends. This came up on the reading quiz, I think not in the lecture I gave. But the thought is, look, whatever sort of uh, serves as the serves the will as the objective ground of its self-determination is the end, and this, if it is given through mere reason, must be equally valid for all rational beings. So the thought is, you have your will and you're acting on the basis of imperatives, and you're sort of, what, what is sort of grounding your acting? What is sort of grounding the decision you make? And the thought is, oh, it's the end, the thing you're trying to accomplish. So what is the grounds of the decision you make to act in a certain way? Well, it's the reason that you're acting, or the end that you're trying to accomplish, or the goal. And not only is this not new to Kant, it's not new to the class. We saw Aristotle had a similar conception. He said all action has a sort of goal or an end in mind, and so, or all deliberate action. So all willed action, all the action that our will is in charge of, has some sort of end in mind. And Kant says, if this is given through mere reason, it must be equally valid for all rational beings. So the thought is, look, a lot of the goals we have come from, for instance, our desires. So I might have a goal to eat a sandwich. Why? Because I'm hungry. Or I might have a goal to exercise. Why? Because I want to be strong. Or I might have a goal to study. Why? Because I want to get a good grade. So a lot of our ends come from things that we want. But Kant says, Imagine that you can get an end not from your desires or something, but just from rationality itself. Rationality just gives you an end regardless of your desires, basically. 
if rationality can do this sort of no matter what you want, regardless of your desires, the thought is, oh, it gives that end to everybody. Why? Well, because look, the things that set us apart from each other is not rationality. We're all equally rational. Rationality is the same for you as it is for me. What sets us apart is our sort of desires, our inclinations. So you want one thing, I want something else. That's what makes human beings different from each other. All rational creatures are equally rational. It's not like I have my special kind of rationality where two plus two equals five, and you have a different kind where two plus two equals three. No, rationality is just the same for everybody. So if there's such thing as an end that rationality gives us on its own without any of our personal desires mixed in, the thought is, oh, that's gonna be the same end for every rational creature. So what does that look like? Well, we haven't really gotten there yet, but the thought is, hmm, if there could be some sort of end that just comes from rationality, that would be the same for all the rational creatures. By contrast, what contains merely the ground of the possibility of the action whose effect is the end is called the means. So again, the means is just uh, what you need to do in order to accomplish the end, or as Kant points it, puts it, what grounds the possibility of the action. So what makes it possible for you to achieve the end? Oh, it's the means. So what makes it possible for me to uh, eat the sandwich? Oh, it's uh, putting the bread on top of the ingredients and putting my hand around it, and we, you know, whatever the means are to accomplish the end. Uh, and I think we'll skip the rest. So this gets even more technical, but um, this is even less important. So the reason we went over again, this again, or the reason we went over this is sort of two kinds of reasons. One, this is kind of like a very simplified review of the stuff we talked about last time in the description of the will. And second, this brings in the idea of ends and means, which we've seen in this class a few times before, but they're gonna become very important in this section of the reading. So we want to sort of remind ourselves what is an end, what is a means to an end, what do these things mean? So that was topic number one, how the will works again. The second topic is this idea of a lying promise and using someone merely as a means. So as you read through uh, this section, Kant will sort of again introduce his principle of morality, and again he'll sort of give the four examples that he gave in the previous reading, but he'll describe them differently. One of the examples, as you saw in the previous reading, um, and I think it's it was also in the first section, is making a lying promise to pay back money so that somebody lends you money but you're not gonna pay them back. And so this time when he uses it, he uses it to illustrate uh, a principle of what he calls using somebody merely as a means or treating somebody merely as a means or treating humanity merely as a means or treating a person merely as a means rather than an end in itself. So the thought is we just had this discussion of means and ends in uh, how the will works and Kant is going to develop that into the idea of treating a person or treating rationality as a means or treating a person or treating rationality as an end in itself. And he's going to suggest you should never treat somebody's, you should never treat a person or a human or a rationality merely as a means. It's okay to treat it as a means as long as you also treat it as an end in itself. So what exactly that means you'll see as you read through. What we're gonna look at here is one sort of particular example of it because this is a little confusing. So uh, second, as to the necessary or owed towards or owed duty towards others, the one who has it in mind to make a lying promise to another will see right away that he wills to make use of another human being merely as a means without the end also being contained in this other. So the thought is if you make a lying promise to somebody, you say, I'm gonna pay you back the money you loan me, but you know you're not going to. You treat them merely as a means. You will that they be used merely as a means, not as an end in themselves. So how or why? For the one I want to use for my aims through such a promise, so the person that you're tricking by lying, cannot possibly be in harmony with my way of conducting myself towards him and thus contain in himself the end of this action. So the thought is, what is the end? What is the goal behind your lying promise? Oh, your, your goal is to get money out of this person without having to pay it back. And Kant says, it's literally impossible for them to share this end. 
if they shared this end with you, they wouldn't give you the money, right? Like they would know that you're lying uh, and they would know that you're not going to pay it back. So they can't share your end. They have to be treated merely as a means to achieve the end for this whole plan to work. So the thought is when you lie to somebody, when you sort of incorporate or when you lie to somebody to manipulate them, you're sort of incorporating them into your plan, but they cannot share the end of your plan. They cannot sort of be united with your will trying to achieve the goal. If you unite them like that, the whole plan breaks down. The lie isn't going to work. So the thought is lying promises have to treat people merely as a means to achieve the end because they can't sort of be part of or share the end itself. So that's one example Kant gives of sort of what it means to treat somebody merely as a means rather than an end. He's got his other three examples, which you'll read through um, when you read the section. So that finishes section two of the lecture. And then the third point to look at is this idea of autonomy versus heteronomy. So this first very briefly comes up on page 51. He says, um, I look, well, the imperative, uh, okay, so earlier he's talking about the categorical imperative, which is, you know, the fundamental basis of morality for him. And he says, I'll call this principle, the principle of the categorical imperative, more or less, the principle of the autonomy of the will in contrast to every other, which on this account I call, which on this account I count as heteronomy. And he doesn't really explain this. Where it gets explained is down on 58, 59. So just keeping track so far, we know that morality is autonomy and everything else is heteronomy, but it's not really clear exactly what else is going on. But then we get the explanations here on page 58 and 59. So he says, autonomy of the will as the supreme principle of morality. Autonomy of the will is the property of the will through which it is a law to itself independently of all properties of the objects of volition. So if that sounds familiar, that's good, because remember, we were talking about the will earlier in this lecture, and we were saying sort of what is determining the will or what are the principles guiding the will. And Kant thinks if reason alone were guiding the will without any sort of inclination mixed in or whatever, that would be the same for everybody. So that would be interesting. It turns out he thinks reason alone guiding the will is what it is to be moral. We've seen that in the first section. We saw it again in the reading from last time. We'll see it again in the reading here. And here we're learning that autonomy of the will is the property of the will through which it is a law to itself, independently of all properties of the objects of volition. So basically, this is the same thing, the will sort of determining itself merely by reason, not through mixing in any other stuff, and specifically not through mixing in any desires or whatever. And so he thinks this is autonomy, autonomy of the will, the will being in charge of itself rather than being ruled by, for instance, uh, desire. And in fact, I said, for instance, desire, really, those are just the two options. The will rules itself through reason, because reason and the will are just the same thing. If you have reason, you have a will. If you have will, you have reason. So either the will rules itself through reason, and that's autonomy, or it doesn't, and it gets ruled by desire. And it turns out heteronomy of the will is what happens if the will seeks that which should determine it anywhere else than in the suitability of its maxims for its own universal legislation. Hence, if it insofar, well, yeah, well, hence, if it, insofar as it advances beyond itself, so as far as the will goes beyond itself, goes beyond reason, it seeks the law in the constitution of any of its objects, then heteronomy always comes out of this. So, um, kind of a complicated uh, sentence, but basically, if the will is looking for something to determine it outside of itself, outside of mere reason, that's heteronomy, then the will does not give itself the law but the object through its relation to the will gives the law to it. So what are these objects? Um, I, basically anything else. So desires are the big ones. So through this relation of heteronomy, whether it rests now on inclination or on representations of reason, 
oh, yeah, sorry, so I'll explain that in a moment. Only hypothetical imperatives are possible. I ought to do something because I will something else. Good, so two points here. One is heteronomy of the will, your will being ruled by something other than uh, autonomy, basically, ruled by something other than morality. That always gives you hypothetical imperatives. And hopefully that sort of kind of makes sense, because if you think back to the previous reading, Kant has the hypothetical imperatives and the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is morality, and the hypothetical imperatives are anything else. So it sort of makes sense that if your will is not determined by morality, then your will is determined by hypothetical imperatives, which are just everything else. And so the second thing to note is that I made a mistake. I said the options are reason and desire. And so either reason is the good thing or desire is the bad thing. It's actually slightly more complicated. So as Kant points out here, there are representations of reason, which sort of are hypothetical imperatives, which are not autonomy, which are heteronomy. What exactly those look like, we'll actually get um, an example of this uh, later in this reading. So when you get to uh, the stuff about God near the end, um, oh, it's here on page 60. So eventually you'll get there and you'll see some of this stuff. It's not super important. The main thing to keep in mind is that autonomy is when sort of reason is ruling the will alone through the categorical imperative, basically. It's acting on the categorical imperative, making that its motive or its maxim. And heteronomy of the will is everything else. So the word autonomy comes from Greek auto, which is self, and nomos, which is law or rule. So it's like self-rule or self-law. So you can kind of understand why autonomy of the will is the will ruling itself or reason ruling itself, ruling itself merely through reason self-rule. Reason is in charge of reason. Reason is in charge of the will. The will is in charge of the will. And then heteronomy is just from hetero, different, and nomos, law or rule. So something else giving the law, something else giving the rule. That would be heteronomy. And so, uh, just summing everything up, when the will rules itself through reason, when the will rules itself with the will, basically, that's autonomy of the will, that's the supreme principle of morality, that's in accordance with or it's equivalent to the categorical imperative. When you're determined by desire or something like that, when your will is being ruled by something else, that's heteronomy of the will, that's not morality. And uh, this is sort of one of the building blocks of Kant's moral theory. And if we think back to Aristotle, very different view. For Aristotle, being a good person, being a virtuous person, means having the right desires. There's other things too, there's lots of other things, but part of being a virtuous person is that you want to do the right thing. You've got the right desires. The right desires are making you do the right thing for the right reasons. For Aristotle, if you do the right thing, but you feel bad about it, you're continent. It's not virtue. It's better than doing the wrong thing. It's better than being incontinent, but you're not fully virtuous if you don't feel the right way. For Kant, if you're acting on feeling, if you're acting on desire, that's heteronomy of the will. That's not autonomy of the will. That's not morality. Morality is when you do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because it feels good. So that's one huge difference between Kant and Aristotle, and we sort of get more perspective on it by thinking about autonomy and heteronomy of the will.